was the night before Christmas and up in the tower, everyone was partying except for one wallflower. John McClain missed his wife, things just weren't the same since Holly had moved west and changed her last name. A truck had pulled up and who should disembark but 14 men whose intentions were dark. <laughs> Welcome to Script Apart, a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies. Each episode, we speak to a brilliant screenwriter who's kindly dug out their initial screenplay for what became a beloved movie, discussing what changed, what didn't, and why, from first draft to the big screen. On this very special festive bonus episode of Script Apart, we're celebrating the holidays the only way we could, with a deep dive into the writing of Die Hard, with none other than the film's co-writer, Stephen E. D'Souza. Yes, it's a Christmas film. In fact, for countless people around the world, Die Hard is the Christmas movie, a touching yuletide tale of family reconciliation that just so happens to feature a ton of explosions. Die Hard is a film that needs no introduction, but here's a short one anyways. Bruce Willis became a megastar after his role in this 1988 action classic, starring as John McClane, a no-nonsense New York City cop who becomes embroiled in a terrorist takeover of his wife's workplace, the Nakatomi Tower in Los Angeles. McLean ventures to LA intent on winning back his estranged wife, Holly. John's not the only uninvited guest, however, who turns up at her company's Christmas party. Enter Hans Gruber, one of the greatest action villains in movie history, played by the late, great Alan Rickman. Stephen, who had previously written Commando, came on board the project after screenwriter Jeb Stewart originated the film, adapting the 1978 novel Nothing Lasts Forever by Roderick Thorpe. Die Hard had been envisioned as Rambo in an office block, a gun-toting B-movie based on a book in which John is attempting to save his daughter, not his wife. The film, however, ended up becoming something grander, an action movie that broke almost every action movie rule, hiding a sentimental heart and redefining American movie masculinity in the process. In the conversation you're about to hear, Stephen and I cover pretty much everything about this timeless action adventure. From his home in LA, full of the wildest Die Hard memorabilia imaginable, Stephen shared with us a ton of secrets from the development of Die Hard. Get ready to discover why he considers Hans Gruber to be the protagonist of Die Hard, why he and Jeb got rid of a plot thread that involved McLean fighting Hans Gruber's father in World War II, and why the film, in his opinion, is more of a Christmas movie than Bing Crosby's White Christmas. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demeck. Stephen, thanks so much for joining us on this special festive edition of Script Apart. As a certain New York cop might say, welcome to the party, pal. Um, Die Hard occupies such an immense place in our pop culture, not just at Christmas, all the way through the year. What kind of place does it occupy in your life all this time on? How often do you find yourself thinking about this film and thinking about that character, John McClane? It crosses my mind when I flip channels and it goes by. It seems to me it's (laughs) always playing somewhere. Um, I don't dwell on it, but it seems that every year when the holidays roll around, that all of a sudden it gets resurrected. People like start hitting me up on social media. Do you think it's a Christmas movie? And I get, you know, various publications and magazines and, you know, it, it's a regular thing. Now the debate is a Christmas movie, which I think would have been put to bed by now. Yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, 20th century Fox, you know, like here we have this, you know, this one, right. Have you seen this? <laughs> is that an advent calendar? Have you seen this one? I haven't No. Oh, it's a fake children's book. It, it's, no it's way. called, it says die, a die hard Christmas. <laughs> right. This is already this is from two years ago. And it, it, it looks like a children's book, the illustrated holiday classic. And it's a um, uh, a, a parody of the night before Christmas poem. So it says, <laughs> "Twas the night before Christmas and up in the tower, everyone was partying except for one wallflower. John McClane missed his wife. Things just weren't the same since Holly had moved west and changed her last name. <laughs> a truck had pulled up and who should disembark but 14 men whose intentions were dark so yeah, I go well listen the studio says it's a Christmas movie right they've got the, the, a die hard Christmas and the the um, what was it the 30th anniversary uh, um, uh, re-release of the blue was in a steel case with like it looked like a Christmas sweater mm. 
yeah. don't know if he had that in the UK, you know, so it seems undeniable now, but I still have to like, uh, I finally made a chart up. I'll share it with you. Um, uh, it's the chart uh, proving it's a Christmas movie uh, by comparing it to White Christmas. We can all agree, I hope, that the Bing Crosby movie from 1954, 55, A White Christmas is mm-hmm. a Christmas movie. <laughs> yeah. So I have a check a checklist showing that Die Hard is, is inarguably – uh, more Christmas Eve than White Christmas, <laughs> so uh, I I'll, I can enumerate it right now. But it's it's probably better seen than than, than than described. I should mention for the listeners as well that we have had many guests on this show, but no one has quite come close to the treasure trove of memorabilia that, that is Stephen's backdrop right now. Everybody has their like their like. Uh, well, all here she I have she was my very first job in Hollywood. She so have memorabilia from that. Six million Amazing. Million. We got. Commando. Oh, there he is. That's the guy. So I, I'd rather have this shelf than uh, Oscars. In the 32 years since Die Hard came out, have you figured out what it is about the film that struck such a chord? Behind you is this kind of Santa's grotto of awesome <laughs> uh, you know, John McClane toys and sort of books and things like that. Not every single action film no, gets no. that response. Not every single action film people are still talking about after all this time. There's what do you put book. it down to? The coloring book. That's amazing. I think it was uh, kind of a perfect um, um, can, a Venn diagram uh, of a number of trends. Uh, the main one was it was almost like a um, palate cleanser uh, or a, um, a course correction after these kind of preposterous movies, some of which I had a hand in, in which the heroes were all these uh, superhuman, you know, bigger than life figures. Uh, you know, Stallone and Schwarzenegger. And although I didn't work with him, Chuck Norris, there was a whole kind of things where the heroes were just these preposterous role models. This fortunately was, you know, like a pendulum swing, a course correction, and it was welcome. And it's funny, it didn't have to be that way because when they sent the picture out, despite the fact that the script was written to be any kind of a normal you know, grounded hero, they still, the studio could not restrain itself from insisting we go to the usual suspects. So the script was sent to Stallone. Yeah. It was sent to Schwarzenegger. Uh, it, there's a famous list somewhere. And then Richard Gere turned it down. Jimmy Kahn to this day says, what was I thinking? They went to everybody. And then it was one of those situations where the studio had a release date, you know, like you're chasing the release date and they're in a panic. And they went to Bruce Willis in desperation. This is a famous story. And he got $5 million, which was a record-breaking price for a movie star at that point. Richard Dreyfuss, who was a friend of mine, he fired his agent uh, the next day and said, I've got Academy Award. I don't get $5 million. (laughs) So it it, it had repercussions that went all through the town. And I think had we not had Die Hard with Bruce Willis as a very grounded hero, you would not have had Keanu Reeves uh, Mm -hmm. as an action star. You would not have had uh, Mark Wahlberg as an action star. You would not have had, I don't think you would have had, you know, know, might not have had Daniel Craig as Bond. I mean, Daniel Craig is, all the other Bonds were six, over six feet tall. Daniel Craig is what, five, nine, five, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I I think it opened the door uh, for a different kind of storytelling. And it also, to the degree that what makes something really catch fire is the audience kind of identifying and bonding with the lead. I mean, Star Wars like works because despite the, you know, the, the, you know, cosmic setting, you go, Oh, it's a teenage lead. He's like me. He doesn't get along with his parents. He wants to get out of his small town. You know, there's a starting point in a lot of big franchises where you can sort of identify with the lead character, Mm. uh, the Marvel universe, uh, uh, which it's like dominates, you know, filmmaking now, exists because Stan Lee, uh, who we lost recently and I knew very well, he had the the brainstorm in the 1960s that the previous model for comic books, that you put a teenage sidekick in the story for the readers to identify with. He had the insight to go, you know what? The readers don't want to be the sidekick. They want to be the hero. And so Spider-Man revolutionized the comic book industry by having you know, a, a, a teenager as the lead. So I, th- that identifiable person, I think that Die Hard did that for the audience as well. You can say to yourself, wow, I could be that hero. He's scared. He's nervous. 
He's frightened, but he's still like, you know, pulling it together. So uh, I think that is uh, what really w- was the magic, uh, the secret ingredient in that film. It was, as you say, game changing. It did bring new things to the action genre. How much of its success do you put down to kind of like the emotional heft of the film? Because if you dig beneath the explosiveness of the film and all those incredible action beats, there's some actually pretty powerful undercurrents of family, responsibility, reconciliation, all things that are Christmas movie staples, we should add. No, absolutely. That is a factor. I do not think it would have the legs it did uh, were, it, were it not for that. I think that, again, it further allows you to identify with the hero. In other words, when they, you know, if they tell the hero, they, they, uh, they want, by the way, this is one of the things I think why the Daniel Craig bonds have been worked so well. There's a strong emotional underpinning. I believe that that is the factor. It helps you identify it with it. Uh, you could say, I understand what, it, what he's fighting for. I mean, yes, he has to save everybody. He has to save the day, but he has to save the day because he's trying to save his loved one and, and get his marriage back on track. And then also to the degree that somewhere I have the, um, you know, the audience test scores um, that the film tested higher with women than with men, which is very unusual for an action movie. So I think it allowed the audience to uh, to really engage with it uh, in a way that you might not in like in a Chuck Norris movie or where they say, uh, here's your mission. Someone stole an atomic bomb. And, the, and so it's more uh, it's kind of a more intellectual and. Uh, um uh, at a remove, he says, well, we, you know, we must save the world from nuclear proliferation. I mean, on an intellectual level, the audience can relate to that, but on an emotional level, they only relate to the bad guy. Oh, he's, he kidnapped that woman. He's got a knife to her throat. So mm. you get like a momentary spike of concern, but, um, uh, to a lesser degree, uh, cause the movie is kind of a cartoon and commando that also made commando work that like, it was a totally, you know, totally personal reason that he was involved in the story he's invested in it. Mm. So that definitely is a factor. And I think that's also why it, um, it, it, it sort of like grew and grew and developed uh, a, a, a reputation as a Christmas movie. Now we were not really thinking it was a Christmas movie. I mean, Joel Silver said, I want to set this movie. I want to do this movie because it's set at Christmas because it'll play on television every Christmas and we'll get a residual (laughs) check. Not that it would become. It was only when when I went to the set and saw like, you know, not only a Christmas tree in the lobby, but decorations. But almost every desk, you know, for the imaginary workers had like Christmas cards or stuff, stuff, Santa's and stuff. And I go, hey, this really is pretty Christmassy. Mm. You know, uh, that's when it hit me. Uh, But I had no idea that it would like. Go, you know, it would become like an official entry in, in the uh, in the Christmas movie uh, sweepstakes. The book that the film was loosely adapted from, adapted at first by uh, by Jeb, who you know you've spoken so warmly in the past about his magnificent work, kind of breaking the story. Because from the sounds of it, the book is quite dark. Definitely not a Christmas family. No, movie. no, no. It is Christmassy. The movie does take place over the Christmas season, but it covers three or four days. Not okay, like right, right. The compression was something that uh, I would have normally normally be inclined to do. If you sort of analyze my pictures mm-hmm. uh, or most action movies, frankly, uh, they take place in a short period of time. Yeah. Uh, Commando. He sets his watch. Right. He's got. Once they kidnap him, they say you've. You know, we're putting you on a plane. You got to like whack the. You know, your friend in uh, in Valverde. Oh, if only I'd copyrighted Valverde, which has now been in like, I think if you do the math, like 35 movies. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, so that's like eight or 10 hours, 48 hours. Hello. The title is 48 hours. Um, and I think you could look at uh, even Bond movies seem to take place. You no, know, like, you know, um, uh, a Bond movie, it says Blowfield has given us 72 hours to deliver, you know, like a million dollars or whatever it was, you know, like in, in those days. Um, yeah. So, uh, but he, but it, it, it went with my natural inclination and John also wanted it to be uh, strangely enough. Like I think he said uh, uh 12th night or a midsummer's night dream. He said, made, made some kind of uh, I think he said uh, a midsummer's night dream is, is a strange thing because you have uh, this, the, all these characters who are drawn into the, uh, into the story. And uh, there's also some, uh, impersonations and things. So you have to talk to John McTiernan for his deep analysis of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the book does take place over Christmas. Uh, it does have uh, the building uh, taken hostage. Um, where the differences are is the character is uh, 
in his 60s. He's a retired cop. Mm-hmm. He's visiting his daughter, uh, who works for the company, uh, who does fall out of the building. He, yeah. <laughs> uh, he, 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 he is severely wounded. The book ends on an, on an ambiguous note. You don't know whether he's going to live or die because he's severely wounded and he's, he's fading in out of consciousness as the paramedics are looking at him. Um, so uh, the bones are there. Uh, there is, there isn't a sense of humor in the book. Mm. Uh, and uh, there aren't the, the uh, plot twists uh, that we have. The problem with the book is the book is a kind of a, uh, a third person point of view. You, the entire book is seen through the eyes of, of the character. It's seen through his point of view. So there's large stretches where nothing is happening, where he's thinking about what can I do next? He's trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, there's a long flashback to ch- when he thinks about his daughter and childhood, how they did not like get along. He should have been a better father. Um, it's uh, it, it takes a whole, it, there's like a chapter or two before he gets to Los Angeles. It starts out in New York. Uh, he's about to leave. He stops somebody from uh, uh, stealing a car radio. Uh, he arrests the guy. Uh, then he flirts with a stewardess on the plane. So uh, we cut to the chase. Uh, in the uh, in in the movie, and uh, have this greatly condensed story. There's even in the book uh, he realizes that uh, Hans is the son of a Nazi that he arrested during the war because he's the book is published. <laughs> the book is published in the seventies. Yeah, he's in the sixties. So in World War II, he was an army intelligence, no and he way. captured Hans Gruber's father, who was a Nazi, <laughs> and he realizes that he met Hans Gruber when he visited his father in Spandau prison as a little boy. <laughs> so there's all this stuff that's, uh, that's, it, that's in the book that, uh, you know, is not in the movie. And in the, in the, in the book, they really are the uh, uh, terrorists. They really have a legitimate, so to speak, uh, uh, bone of contention with the oil company. They are radical, uh, like the, uh, the, the Biedermann Monhoff gang, whatever it was called in, in Germany. They are a, a version of that. And they are uh, have a complaint, uh, a complaint about the company. And the company is, in fact, like uh, 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 um, evacuating and, and uh, displacing indigenous tribes in Indonesia, indigenous people in Indonesia to do this huge like construction project, which is referenced in the uh, in the movie when uh, he says, ah, models, I love to, to make such when I was a child, the details. And uh, Mr. Yeah. Joggy says, is this about that? That's all rumors. We're not displacing indigenous people with that. <laughs> so there's hints of the original plot of the of the movie. But um, uh, uh, John quite rightly said, you know, you, 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 you terrorist is like that's the, that's that's what you do in all the Chuck Norris movies. Right. All the B movies. So terrorist, terrorist, terrorist. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, but like if they're thieves, it's more fun. And not only that, there's a long tradition of. I'm getting very granular now. Uh, it's, it, it, it's not an action movie. This is technically an adventure process movie from the wrong side. Yeah, adventure it's like a process heist. movie is like uh, Tupcapi or the um, Dirty Dozen or um, the Asphalt Jungle where, or um, uh, Big Deal on Madonna Street mm. where people are planning some operation and we see them practice, practice and rehearse. And then they go do it and it goes right or wrong. So this is really a, an adventure process movie flipped yeah. where, where, it, where the team are the bad guys. Uh, so it helps actually, it helps when you're doing that, when you're writing it, because uh, it, 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 it gets you out of the, the rut of thinking, okay, um, what can happen to my, what can happen now to the good guy? And you see a lot of uh, action movies, you know, you know that they're having trouble telling the story when the opening scene of an action movie is kind of a random scene where the hero stops a crime. Yeah. You know, like, you know, like, you know, like your opening scene list just stop a crime just because the problem with franchise heroes is they cannot wake up and be proactive. They have to be reactive. So a movie about a firefighter, um, he can't, a firefighter can't wake up and say, I'm going to rescue a baby from a burning building today. Mm. Like the fire has to start. The detective uh, has to wait for the crime to be committed. So uh, the solution to that I, I do in like when I do seminars and I talk to writers is look at this thing from the villain's point of view. There's a whole debate. I'm always in someone raises their hand 
Uh, people confuse hero and villain with protagonist and antagonist, uh, and they are not the same. And the protagonist, with, which is a, began as a Greek word, was the first person to speak in the chorus. And the antagonist would say something contrary. So I have this all the time. Who's the protagonist of Jaws? It's the shark. <laughs> yeah. But, no, really, really. The protagonist yeah. of Die Hard is Hans Gruber. And, you know, I have all these writers when I mentor them and then they go, I'm having trouble with the obligatory scene. I have to do the obligatory scene, but then the movie doesn't get started. And I go, no, the obligatory scene is something that happened. It doesn't have to be in the movie. Mm. The obligatory scene of Die Hard was when the the fast food was delivered to, to the apartment where Hans Gruber was recruiting guys for the mission. It's not yeah. in the movie. It was like it was like three months earlier. <laughs> yeah. In Berlin, you just have to know what happened. Yeah. You know, so the way this movie got put together was realizing what it is. There's a lot of action, but it's actually an adventure process movie from the wrong side constructed as a thriller. So prior to this point, you had obviously been all the kind of like action staples that we're discussing. You know, you had been involved in so many projects that helped establish a lot of those staples. Were you kind of conscious? Uh, or did you have a craving as you kind of came onto this project to like undo some of those things or sort of turn them on the head? Because this film, yeah, really does, as we've been discussing, do something different. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I was aware that it was it was uh, uh, a completely uh, different, different and that we were uh, uh, going against that. So what I would say as we were doing it would say this is the opposite of Rambo. Uh, in Rambo, you remember uh, there's a scene where uh, the evil commies. And I had a whole career fighting commies. All the TV shows I did. Remember, I started out doing, uh, I guess, the $6 million man. That was one of my first gigs, right? Yeah. Uh, all those shows, uh, they were always commies. Partially because uh, they would do these shows with, with the assistance of the, um, the Pentagon. So, mm -hmm. like, in other words, you needed, they needed stock footage. Or he was supposed, the $6 million man was in the Air Force. You know, they would let us go on Air Force bases and stuff. So, uh, uh, my, my break in Hollywood, I wrote a spec script which was a body horror science fiction movie. It was sort of like Alien meets RoboCop, uh, where a, uh, a spaceship lands in a small town and some kind of mechanical thing gets out and starts like chopping people up and, and they find their... Did you ever read uh, about the Mountains of Madness? No. Uh, by so. H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, anyway, uh, where they find, find these people, they've been dissected and their parts are all... Oh, my God. So it was like that. And then... Uh, I got it somehow, long story to be told later, I got it to the producers of The Six Million Dollar Man and me, and the first thing they do is they said, we want you to rewrite this into a two-hour, two-parter premiere, but you can't kill anybody, and the, uh, spoiler alert, the renegade space probe can't be an American space probe that's going high wire, it has to be a Russian space probe. <laughs> so I had a long experience doing the obvious things, communist villains, flag-waving heroes, um, and... Um, in Rambo, probably the last gasp of the commie villains, um, at one point they capture Stallone and they strap him to the bed springs of a mattress that's had all the stuffing pulled out. And they put like electrodes on his gonads and they're torturing him. He breaks free. He kills all nine commies in the room. <laughs> then he grabs the microphone and he calls the main commie and says, I'm coming to get you myself. <laughs> now that is the, so, so Bruce Willis, like, running upstairs and trying to like call the police right for help is the complete yeah. polar opposite of that. Uh, and we knew it. Uh, someone once said to me, well, you could not make diehard work today because everybody has cell phones. And uh, I said, no, the only difference would be that Hans Gruber would decide on whether he would, he would collect all the cell phones. You had one more moment where all the cell phones would be collected. Mm hmm. Right. But then he would go on. Um, he would go on um, uh, Periscope personally. <laughs> yeah. But other than that, it would be the same movie. I, I yeah. believe uh, uh, that I was the first person to address the uh, the storytelling sabotage of the ubiquitous um, uh, cell phones in Die Hard 2. Um, uh, he, didn't, he didn't have a cell phone, but he had a beeper. His wife tries to call him when he's sneaking up on one of the guards. Yeah, that's right. Right. And it, and it beeps and the guy, and he has to fight with the guy with the icicle. Uh, I felt <laughs> I had to address the fact that everybody had cell phones and, and beepers and stuff like that. 
So now, now I, I, trust me, I will never do the one where no service, no service. That's where, that's where everybody gets around <laughs> it now. They go, no service, batteries, you know. So um, there's other ways of getting around it. So, Stephen, to dive into the script a little bit, the film opens in this slightly unusual way that's, that's intact in this draft. So we start in a 747 as it lands in L.A., the moment just after landing where you let out the sigh of relief that you've made it in one piece. As the plane taxis to its gate, the passengers stir, gather personal belongings. We zoom in on John McClane, mid-30s, good-looking, athletic, and tired from his trip. He sits by the window. His relief on landing is subtle, but we notice. Suddenly, he hears from the seat next to him a salesman's voice. You don't like flying, do you? They get talking and famously, now, the salesman advises him the best way to blow off jet lag is to take off your socks and shoes. Then you walk around on the rug barefoot and make fists with your toes. Now, of course, this interaction sets in motion one of the wildest elements of Die Hard. John having to take down this cabal of terrorists in his bare feet throughout the entire ordeal. Can you tell me where that idea came from and whether that is actually a, a legitimate cure for jet lag? Is that something you made up? You know, I really cannot remember uh, if the I, I'm sure the, the the being scared to fly uh, is definitely from Jeb. Mm. Uh, but I think I put in the fist with the toes. I'm not sure. But walking around barefoot or something. I think it was walk around and stretch or something like that. The important thing here is it grounded him as a normal guy. Yeah. Which is further reinforced when the limousine pulls up and he says, I never rode in a limousine before. And he says, my first day driving one. And then you see he's in the front seat, which again grounds him as a regular, regular guy. So these were very, 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 very smart, clever things. Uh, and the other thing that follows suit with that is that uh, Bruce, the actor, shows fear and terror throughout the film. Again, remember when all the bad guys break in, he doesn't do a Stallone. Oh, oh, oh I'll take him out right now. You know, he, he spends the first act of the movie trying to call the police. He sets up a fire alarm. Then he tries to find a working phone. You know, then he steals the the the, uh, the walkie talkie and he, you know, calls the police on a channel. Uh, so uh, this and I kept this going in the second film. I wrote I did the second movie as well. Yeah. Where he was still um, still scared to fly. He was still a technophobe. He didn't know how to operate the fax machine. Uh, and all that has gotten subsequently lost. The last couple of movies he's all but a superhero. Yeah. He's flying all over the world. He's crashing cars into helicopters. He's jumping off buildings without being afraid. <laughs> he jumps yeah. off this building. He says, oh, God, oh, God, please let me live. Yeah. You know, so uh, I, we, all the way through, I was conscious of making him a relatable real person, which mm -hmm. I think is what made the picture work and what like launched his career and the career of many of the other, you know, uh, more relatable guys. I mean, Count Reese, I mean, now not in not in. Uh, the lock movies, yeah. Uh, but uh, in his other work, uh, you know, uh, being a more relatable, uh, relatable hero. I'm talking about like uh, uh, Point Blank, uh, Point Blank, not Point Blank. Uh, point. What was it, what's the movie with the, the point break. diving? Point Break. Yes, Point yeah, Break. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, I, I think that was important, and uh, it still makes uh, you know a lot of these a lot of films work. And of course, you still have the Die Hard in the White House, you know, and the Die Hard on an airplane and stuff like that. Uh, but even even in those, I mean, Harrison Ford um, uh, uh, also plays a very, you know, grounded hero. If you think about the beating he takes and yeah. that's after, isn't that after Die Hard Indiana Jones? What's the timeline? Um, Temple of Doom was 84. So the first one would have been like 81, 82 or something. All right. So it, pre it precedes. Yeah. So as you mentioned, you do start on this moment of vulnerability that you then like really hammer home by having him pick out the overhead compartment, this big giant teddy. So you're starting to get the sense of like, he looks tough, but there's this, yeah, groundedness to him, a vulnerability. He then gets picked up in a limo by Argyle. And this character kind of offers a lot of comedic beats, but he's also pretty handy in this introductory scene in terms of exposition. So yes. you and Jeb wrote him as kind of nosy, which forces John to open up to him and in turn to the audience about his broken marriage. Can you tell me a little bit about like that character and what you hoped he would bring to the film? Well, he is kind of a surrogate for the audience because he's watching the whole movie. Yeah. And so just as the audience, you want to help the hero, he ends up helping the hero, which is actually, I'm going to get less psychology of it because some of it's accidental. He originally, you know, had it not been for the ambulance thing, which came up the last minute, he would not have had a moment of heroism. So it's funny it worked out that way. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the movie stars were, were in alignment. Um, 
But uh, that's a very important uh, contribution that Jeb made in the book. The character that uh, uh, the, the character that uh, uh, it's kind of a domino of a change uh, that Jeb made. The character that um, overhears the walkie-talkie conversation from uh, McLean character was a gypsy taxi driver. Uh, mm-hmm. And this, remember, the book was written in the seventies, and at that time. There was a whole phenomenon in the United States, I don't know about elsewhere, of CB radios. Yeah. It was the equivalent of uh, Twitter, maybe, where people had okay. these CB radios. And, and prior to that, in order to, have, be, to broadcast, you had to have an FCC license for an amateur. It was called a ham radio. Right, okay. Ham radio. You had to get a license. It was only $50. And you could broadcast as long as you're under 50 watts. But now anybody could get one of these things, no license required. So it was a gypsy cab driver who happened to hear the recording and for a, he was his first interaction for a while until a police officer showed up. So uh, Jeb combined uh, the gypsy cab driver with the, with the cop outside with Al pal. Yeah. Uh, but that, uh, you know, raised the idea of like, you know, what happened to the taxi driver? Somehow the taxi driver who was out of the movie sort of uh, metamorphosized into the limousine driver. Oh, who in the okay. book was just a small beat. Yeah. You know, he had, he had a small conversation with the guy. Um, what happens in the, um, uh, the ta- there's a taxi driver in New York in the book before he comes to LA that he has a conversation with about being a cop because um, somebody c- cuts them off in a moment of road rage. Right. And, yeah. and, uh, uh, and, and uh, the cop says, uh, follow that guy. Uh, I, and then he goes, no, never mind. I got to catch a plane. You know, what do you mean? Follow that guy? He said, well, I, you know, I, what did you see? You know, I could have, you know, I could have arrested him for that, you know? So, uh, it's, it's sort of like you're, I don't know if you, as a writer, uh, and I'm sure you, you, you do your, your shows and you, you know, you're like crossing things out, you're moving paragraphs around yeah. and then you maybe you look at all the things you cut out and says, is there anything here that can go back in? Yeah. So yeah. you can sort of see that happening here yeah. uh, in, in the work process. That's interesting. And there's a couple of really cool lines in this sequence. So McLean explains that this is his first time riding in a limo, just as it's Argyle's first time driving one. He then explains why he can't move to LA. I'm a New York cop who used to be a New York kid, and I got a six-month backlog of New York scumbags I'm still trying to put behind bars. Actually, it follows up a a few uh, moments later. We see John get to the party, and he's kissed on the cheek by a woman, and then he's kissed on the cheek by a guy as well, and he sort of sighs. California. There's a bit of a fish out of water element to oh, Die totally, Hard. totally, totally. And it's kind of like, yeah, so as well as being a Christmas movie, as well as being an action movie, as well as being an adventure process movie, it's also kind of a fish out of water story. Totally. Also, his wardrobe, he's dressed wrong for California weather, you may, if you're, if you're <laughs> paying attention, you know. Yes, yeah. That's interesting. What was kind of today for California For California weather today, he'd be wearing a hazmat suit, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, sadly so. I mean, that's obviously something that goes all the way back to the book. But what do you think that lends to Die Hard? This uh, sort of like the contrast of this like East Coaster in a West Coast situation. He doesn't really belong. Well, I think in the book he had a he had some disdain for the uh, uh, the company his daughter worked at, uh, and uh, uh, he also um, did not like what he had heard about the guy she was seeing. I think she's actually seeing. Uh, um, uh, what's his name in the book? The the uh, guy who's kind of, who was hitting on her. Oh, Ellis. Yeah, yeah. I think she's actually in a relationship with Ellis in the book. Uh, so, but uh, there is much less of the fish out of water thing uh, in the book. In fact, we or actually knocked him down a peg in the in the book. He's a retired uh, detective with mm. uh, with the rank of uh, a senior detective or something, and he was an army intelligence and an officer in the in the World War Two. So he's a much more sophisticated, educated person in the book. And we knocked him down to more of a blue collar character to be in contrast with Alan Rickman. And again, talking about feedback, this is in a crazy way related to um, our uh, casting director, Jackie Birch, and our costume designer, Marilyn uh, Vance, who's an Academy Award winning nominee, Mm. where um, they brought in Alan Rickman was one of the first people cast. Uh, and, uh, they brought in all this kind of like, uh, uh, combat gear, military mufti, you know, uh, for him to wear. Um, 
and uh, you know the, the costume department says he brought some stuff for you to look at, uh, and uh, she says you're not put Alan Rickman you know in in this stuff it's it, it's ridiculous, uh, and then uh, she said I want to ca- I'm not going to cast the usual mooks so let's these guys are from Europe let's like and you got it's already in the script there's this European versus American thing let's mm-hmm. dress them like the Euro trash guys you see in the nightclubs <laughs> yeah you know and then Jack and she have a friend Jackie Burch is. Uh, and, and Marilyn go, Oh, totally, totally. Let's go that way. So as this, you know, I'm friendly with both of them. This got back to me. I went even further in dialogue that way. Remember in the book, he's more of a thug, the terrorist. He's not, that's, he's no more sophisticated than the hero. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to remember also at this time, there was this paranoia in America about foreign companies buying up America. It was a total xenophobic fear. The Japanese, uh, uh, had just bought like one of the studios. I think a Japanese company briefly owned the Empire State Building. And there was all this uh, fear about foreign foreigners taking over America. Now, uh, so, so I embraced that and made it this blue collar American versus this snotty European. Mm-hmm. And so that speech in the movie where he says, who are you? Just an American who's seen too many movies. He thinks he's John Wayne, Marshall Dillon. You know, that is totally embracing this split of course what's funny about this whole thing xenophobia the japanese the germans is the uh the the number one foreign ownership in america to this day is those insidious dutch you know but you never hear anybody wearing us uh, no wonder they say dutch uncle no wonder they say dutch treat it's those damn dutchmen i hear those wooden shoes coming closer in my in my sleep but yeah that's not the so but that doesn't work for the movie you know Hey everyone, this is Al, just jumping in to tell you that support for Script Apart this week comes from Cave Day. Revising scripts requires supreme focus. The best writers know they need to harness everything they've got to overcome internal and external obstacles. Cave Day lead group focus sessions for a worldwide community every day on Zoom that help you do just that. Think of it like a group fitness class, but for your work. A trained guide leads check-ins, deep work sprints, and energizing breaks. Members report they get two to four times more done with Cave Day's science-backed method. Join the world's most focused community and work alongside Emmy winners and Oscar winners. Gift cards are available and make a great present as we head towards the festive season, and Script Apart listeners can try it out for free. Head to caveday.org and type in the promo code SCRIPTAPART, all uppercase, at checkout. That's caveday.org. Okay, let's get back to the conversation. We then get to the building, which... Even in this draft, you describe as one of the stars of the film, well-lit, impressive, and spanking new, the Nakatomi building. So the entire movie's shot in this building. It's not just an exterior. People joke about locations as characters in movies. I mean, that's a bit of a cliche, but I really do kind of feel it applies to Die Hard. There's such a sense of geography that you and Jeb utilize so well. So yeah, how did you go about like uh, learning the contours of that space and writing the action for it? Did you have blueprints or were you kind Absolutely. of going on trips? I was, in fact, I was given a blueprint. There was, a, 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 I think about a year ago, there was a coffee table book that came out for Die Hard. You know, it, it was, <laughs> did you see it? No, but I immediately want it on my Christmas list. This giant coffee table book yeah. with inserts and photographs. It had, uh, and we actually had reproduced the blueprint, mm. which is in a sleeve in the back, the actual blueprint of the building. It's the exact, you know, which... Uh, it was a blueprint of the building, and it was color coded uh, for all of the uh, pra- all of the actual locations that we were going to be using. So I could keep track of it as I wrote it, and I also walked through the building with yeah. the stunt team, right? To to and so some of the things that happen in the movie. So for example, late in the picture when he has the hand to hand fight um, with um, um, I, I, yeah, it's only been twenty five years. I can't remember what his name. <laughs> when he with uh, with um, Gudnov with the um, uh, the guy with the long hair when he has yeah yeah when he has that fight with him and they 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 fall they fall down some steps they land on a fur, on a furniture dolly mm. and they ro- ro- go across the room and cr- and fall off that was really there and I said oh we'll use that in the fight uh, <laughs> you remember he strangles him and he hangs him on the thing those that cable thing to move to move heavy equipment that yeah. was there oh, uh, wow. so uh, the actual building uh, the, the the mise en scene so to speak of of this. Um, uh, building really informed the movie. The when he kills the first guy, he's on an unfinished floor. That was really an unfinished floor. Yeah. So when I saw an unfinished floor, I said, 
can we get permission to smash this all up? Cause it's just like drywall and, uh, and, and, uh, 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 joist like aluminum joist. Mm. Yeah, what the hell? Because yeah, I can knock it over. <laughs> so when they fight, they destroy all the partially constructed stuff. So um, I was always a firm believer in uh, using a location. I, you know, I'm a huge Hitchcock fan, and if you look at the Hitchcock movies, he always uses the location. When he, if you look at the original Man Who Knew Too Much, um, it's in it's in it's in uh, Switzerland, right? Yeah. So the spy gets a message in a chocolate bar. Early in the picture, the guy goes up, he buys a candy bar, and the rapper says, you know, was, has a, tells him to meet somebody somewhere. Yeah. In a uh, uh, foreign correspondent, he, you know, they're trying to figure out how the Nazis disappeared and escaped the, uh, the police chase. And then they notice a windmill is turning opposite to the wind. Mm. It's a signal for a plane to land. Yeah. You know, so uh, the, the fight, the, the, the knockdown drag out fight in a saloon in a cowboy movie where it should be different, where you smash the mirror and you hit each other with liquor bottles and chairs should be different than the knockdown drag out fight in the dentist's office. Yeah. If I did a fight in a dentist's office, sooner or later, the drill would become either the big lamp would be swung around, knock somebody on the head. And yeah. at one point somebody would have the drill. <laughs> so uh, in a strange way to go from the, the uh, sublime to the ridiculous from the ridiculous, to the sublime, I think Die Hard is actually kind of a model of the classic Aristotelian unity of time, place, and action. Yeah. Everything takes place in one place, right, in a short period of time. And it's a good, it's a really excellent uh, model of that. So the building was, a, was definitely uh, uh, a, 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 a create, a, it's, a, it's a perfect pressure cooker. For everybody. Yeah. And again, it established this model Die Hard in it where other people uh, tried to uh, encapsulate the same idea. Die Hard on a plane, Die Hard on a boat, Die Hard in the White House. And strangely enough, the Die Hard movies lost it. <laughs> yeah. After the second picture, it was never longer. It was no longer an isolated place. That's interesting. I definitely want to come back to the sequels. But first, Argo agrees to wait while John enters the building to surprise Holly. And he has to use this keypad to inform the building system that who he's here to see. And in this moment, Holly, it's revealed, has been using her maiden name. Another beat that starts to sort of like feed in the fractures in their marriage. Um, McLean meets Holly's boss, who explains that this is not just a Christmas celebration, but a party marking a big deal worth $150 million. He's reunited with Holly, who says, I was hoping you made that flight. John quietly replies, I was hoping you were hoping that. John then notices this watch that Holly's been gifted for all her hard work, a little token of our appreciation, says Holly's boss. John takes Holly's wrist, holds it up and says, nice, but one of us is four hours out of sync. So two really smart things seem to be happening here in this sequence. So number one, you're showing the fragility of their marriage and you're going from a moment of tenderness and potential reconciliation to like a, a sort of moment of pessimism about their future. And then number two, you're introducing the watch, which will come yes. back in the final scene. Did you plant that here as a kind of Chekhov's gun? Uh, yes, but the, 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 the watch was in the book. Uh, okay. Uh, the, uh, the, the watch was in the book, uh, but uh, it wasn't used in the same manner. Uh, but but uh, the, the watch was in the book. And of course, Holly, spoiler alert, she falls out of the building and dies. But she's also complicit in the uh, machinations of the company in Indonesia. She is actually aware of it and was a participant in it. So she's a little dirty. Mm. Uh, she's a little dirty in the, in the book, which is uh, 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 no longer there. Um, and um, what's interesting is um, uh, there's very little improv in a movie like this because impro improvising in a movie like this could get somebody hurt. Like if you're not standing where you're supposed to be standing and they set off the explosion, you know, so there's, there's very little improv in this movie. Um, there's, um, uh, a couple of lines here and there. Uh, there's a, um, uh, now I know what a TV dinner feels like is an ad lib for Bruce. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, but, um, the scene where, uh, they argue, he, they're, they seem to be getting along and he says, uh, listen, we don't, I'm going to stay with Cappy Roberts. He we moved out to, uh, 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 he moved out here somewhere to, uh, Ramona or something, mm -hmm. yeah, Pomona. 
He says, oh, you'll be in the car like for like, an, you know, an hour and a half each way. Uh, why don't you stay with me? I have a spare room. You know, they're just starting to warm up. And then it suddenly turns into an argument. Yeah. I forget that you probably have the script in front of you. She says, she says something and he jumps. He says, he says, I thought my wife, you know, and they get in this and it's a repeat of an argument they had. This is a scene where I forget how it came up, uh, but um, I went off with Bruce and with Bonnie Bedelia and they improvised a, a, a fight, a couple fight. And I just sat there and took notes, right. And incorporated some of their ad lib into that scene and went into that script. Yeah. So presumably they brought their own experiences in breaking up with somebody to that argument. And that's why that has a kind of a real plausibility to it. Mm. You know, it, it, it's, it's, for, it's kind of petty and personal. And so it's, you know, it, it's very authentic. And then when she walks out of the room, Bruce go realized he, he was an idiot. And he bang, he goes, nice going. <laughs> nice going. <laughs> yes. Down. Head smack on the door. That wasn't in this script. So that was a moment of influence. It was on the set, you know, whether it was, I don't, it was, it was Bruce or, or, or uh, John, but you know, it's a nice touch. Yeah. Says so much. And I love the introduction to our antagonist or actually protagonist as, as we've discussed earlier in this draft. So we've had this Mercedes pull up front and we've started to see the henchmen kind of file into the building and start taking out the uh, sort of guy on the front desk and all that kind of thing. We then get to a moment where the doors to a service elevator open to reveal Hans Gruber impeccably dressed, lean and handsome. He steps out into the lobby like he owns the building. And in a way, he does. I mean, we touched on this a moment ago, but I just want to kind of re-emphasize that it seems like in the same way that you were trying to build a different type of hero in John, you were trying to build a different type of villain in Hans. Oh, absolutely. But remember, he was discovered by our people, not by the the, by, by the, the greater world, the theater world. Mm. Uh, they saw him in... Uh, uh, les liaisons, les liaisons dangereux. I don't know. Maybe I said that right. I don't know. It's been a long time since first <laughs> class. But anyway, he's where he's playing this manipulative, suave uh, villain. Yeah. So uh, that's why he was cast in this picture. So we were embracing, you know, uh, what he had done. You will notice a change there that his introduction is not really coming out of the elevator. He comes in the. He, he you know, John decided, like on the day, to have him come in the front door uh, uh, from the. Uh, doesn't he? Oh, he doesn't. He comes out of the elevator, doesn't he? Yes. The other guys come in the front door from the Mercedes. That's right. Yeah. Again, to go back to the vulnerability, to the much less gung ho nature of John McClane compared to regular heroes. As you mentioned, a moment, like a few minutes ago, he spends the next few scenes, quite a bit of this opening act, hiding. Essentially, he's also trying to kind of get the police's attention. He's there, being smart, learning about who these guys are, and amassing the information needed to take them down. But was there any studio resistance to this at all? Because as we've touched on again and again, this was quite new. This is not like, this is quite passive almost, instead of the kind of like all guns blazing sort of action heroism that audiences and studio execs are used to. There's no violence in this movie for, I think, almost for 19 minutes, I think, 19 or 20 minutes before, yeah, before right. the first thing happens. Uh, no, there wasn't. Uh, there was similar, there was conversations like that uh, on, on the Die Hard 2, which we, you said we'll get to later. Uh, but I think that uh, in the script, I don't think you could look, you've got it in front of you. I'd have to like go on the filing cabinet, but um, <laughs> I don't think it, it, it turned out to be 20 minutes in the movie, but I don't think it's 20 pages in the script. I mean, you have to look at it. What page is that? Is that, do they kill the guy in the lobby? That is on, I think page 19. Or something oh, like it is that. about the same. Mm. Uh, but I, but I don't know. I don't think anybody sort of caught that and said, gee, we should kill somebody sooner, you know? Uh, we, we fortunately did not get that note. Now you would have a big battle if you went like, if you went that long, you know, mm. without like a, a, a violent beat. But yeah. I think it also, um, uh, what it really did, it established our character, our characters and gave the audience a vested interest in everybody. And, and that's why it was incredibly uh, invaluable. Yeah, yeah. And I think it makes the fact you wait for that moment of violence it makes it so much more shocking when you get that one, two of first the uh, sort of like guy at the desk being killed and then sort of hands for all his sophistication. Um, he has that sort of interaction between uh, with, with Holly's boss and he's kind of talking about fashion and he's like mentioning kind of Fortune magazine, all signifiers of sophistication. Yes. yes. And then there's that line, I'll count to three. That won't be a four. Uh, yes, but prior to that, he says, uh, oh, I, I love the models when I was a boy. When Alexander saw his kingdom, you know, again, all this stuff to show he's like a snotty, uh, <laughs> a snotty, sophisticated guy. Mm. Um, 
And that, 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 I don't know who, I, that is not a real tailor in London that, you know, that's a made up tailor name. I wanted to name drop my tailor. I, and now, now I'm sounding like an asshole. No, when I was a kid, uh, I was in high school. Um, Esquire magazine used to always do a special issue for each new Bond movie, mm-hmm. which I would devour. And I made notes and it mentioned the tailor who made the clothes for the Bond movies. And I said to myself, someday when I'm a success, I'm going to get clothes made by the James Bond tailor, which I actually did years later when I was in London <laughs> for the first time. So I wanted to name drop my tailor, but like, I guess the legal department said, no, that's a real tailor. Make him a new name. <laughs> you know, before you shoot a movie, the legal department goes through all the scripts. Yeah. And they, and so if I'll say, um, if I say uh, uh, um, Al Horner is a crime lord, they'll look up and, and, and if, it, if, it was, if it's set in America, it's no problem. But if it's set in England, they'll say there's an Al Horner in England. Can you, you can you change the name? Yeah, and it gets it gets it gets really ridiculous sometimes. Um, on Street Fighter, um, I had the UN in the script, and some idiot uh, at the studio wrote a letter to the UN saying, "Can we put you in this movie?" Now, if you hadn't done that, they would have had no recourse. Mm. You know, it's sort of public domain, but they sent us an angry, threatening letter. So I called it the AN, the Allied Nations, but we kept <laughs> all the signage, all the fonts. <laughs> all of the uniforms and all. The, so every reviewer of the movie and almost all of them dumped on the movie. Now yeah. on the 25th anniversary, it's getting respect lately. Mm. You may have noticed that we've got a steel case coming out and reviewers are now saying, hey, this movie was always supposed to be funny. Whereas <laughs> when it came out, they said this movie is so stupid. It's accidentally funny. I don't know how you could look at that movie and think. Of it. But anyway, um, so, uh, another example was I did the, the movie that almost got me Die Hard in a building mm. uh, to direct was called Possessed which was the uh, true story that under uh, that was underlying the exorcist, um, which was about an exorcism that took place in St. Louis. So again, somebody, a lawyer for the studio writes a letter to the university of St. Louis and they say, we will sue you if you even associate the university of St. Louis with this cockamamie, stupid exorcism stuff. <laughs> but I had done so much, so much extensive research that I had a newspaper article from 1951 saying, believe it or not, an exorcism took place in the St. Louis University Chapel. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, all of a sudden, the, the, they, they went away. But the lawyers can be a bane. But anyway, one of the lawyers said, no, this is really a, you have to make up a fake. Um, I, I probably would have gotten a free tuxedo out of that mention if, I, if it hadn't happened. I don't know. <laughs> Meanwhile, I haven't worn a free tuxedo. I haven't worn long pants in six months. I mean, <laughs> what am I talking about here? I'm wearing shorts here. <laughs> uh, and you've just given away my secret life as a crime lord, Stephen. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, we have that uh, fight between, uh, well, John first starts out evading Hans' henchmen, taking them out one by one. He sets off an alarm and a henchman named Tony comes to investigate. John holds up Tony with his pistol, but Tony's calm. You won't hurt me. You're a policeman. There are rules for policemen. John replies, yeah, my captain keeps telling me the same thing. And they have this gripping fight. Thank you, Alfred Hitchcock, for the inspiration for that fight, <laughs> as, as seen in uh, uh, Torn Curtain. Mm. Do you have like a formula for writing these amazing action sequences and fight scenes? Uh, I like don't this? say I have a formula, but uh, I learned early on when I was working in in the uh, uh, in the uh, Roman galley of, uh, of of series television, one hour, you know, shooting an hour every ten days, um, that uh, you had to find a happy medium in describing an action scene. Uh, if you just say uh, they fight and the hero wins, then the stuntmen are, are sort of going to make something up. And they're going to make up something lame because they're like, you know, it's, you know, they, they don't have any time mm-hmm. in the television production. And if you get too granular, right, it becomes like insane. So uh, I just developed, I guess, over time in, in my, you know, by the time I got the features here, I, I must have done like 75 hours, maybe 100 hours of network television, whatever it added up to uh, all these series I did. Um, so I, I sort of found a way to uh, describe a fight. Um, in uh, general terms, like you might say, um, uh, I might say, uh, uh, Kamal drives Horner back in the corner, blow after blow. <laughs> and suddenly, you know, uh, Kamal, like, you know, uh, it turns tables. You know, like, so you could sort of imply it a little bit. But in a situation like this, where I'd walk the building, remember? Mm. I'd walk the building. And I, in this case, I got very, very specific because I had walked the building with the stunt team. And we said, look, this unf- unfinished floor, it's really here. There was like the, the metal, like flimsy aluminum girders that hold up drywall. Yeah. There was actually uh, construction equipment there. So um, 
Uh, in this case, I maybe got more granular than I normally would. Uh, another example of how the real location affected the action was the building was under construction and throughout the building, in many places, the, f- the fluorescent light fixtures were on the floor. They weren't installed yet. Mm. But this gave the inspiration to um, our cinema. Was it Jack? Who's our cinematographer on that? Um, God, this is embarrassing. It was. Uh, it's Oliver. No, Oliver Wood was. Was it Oliver Wood? Let's do a little Google. I'm right, confusing the second picture. John DeBond. John DeBond. Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. All right, so uh, <laughs> John DeBond, you know, saw all these fluorescent lights which weren't installed yet, and said, "I want to create that look." of the fluorescent lights, which you really could not do because they flicker when you're filming on film. Hmm. Film, let me explain to your audience. Film is this <laughs> uh, me- me- mechanical chemical product that I've actually had interns, like, you know, like I've worked for me, they're usually from colleges, yeah. universities. So they're, they're frequently, they're making, they're working on student films. So we look at my film, I say, show me your dailies. Then they go, what? <laughs> show me your footage. What? <laughs> These terms have they, no, no, they they have they have no meaning in a, in a digital university. You know, really, uh, they've yeah. lost. And so these are now going into, and, and these are going to fall by the wayside. Some of the archaic terms from still exist, like keep your powder dry, mm. right? We know what that means, even though we don't do the guns like this anymore. You know, uh, so um, you're between the devil and the deep blue sea, right? Like that's a nautical term, but like nobody knows. These, but I don't think footage and and dailies are going to like survive uh, uh, our era. Uh, so anyway, uh, the, you know, he, the inspiration for this kind of like cold fluorescent look was, and, and, and actually there's a couple of scenes where we, there's some scenes where he runs through rooms. They're exactly as they were. <laughs> I mean, we just didn't even touch them. There's all the equipment left in the construction crews, but just like moved them around a little bit. So Bruce, so Bruce could run by. So there's this constant feedback from the practical location that informed the movie and makes it that much more real and gritty and, and grounded. Mm. So yeah, John kills Tony and he tries putting Tony's shoes on because of course he's taking his shoes off to do that uh, jet lag cure. Yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's going to find himself like that for a very long time. As he puts it, a million terrorists in the world and I killed the one with beats smaller than my sister, which is such a fun line. John then sends Tony's body down in the elevator with a Santa hat attached and some words written in this draft on a piece of paper folded into his pocket. Yeah. Now I have a machine gun, ho, ho, ho. And in the film, this, of course, um, became written on his jumper. That was in the book, uh, on a piece oh, of paper, was it? the threat, yes. Was it just there was a much more cinematic way of delivering that reveal yeah, yeah, to yeah. write it in what looks like blood on his jumper? I think it's, I, I think it's probably, actually, I think it's magic marker. I think, in fact, I think you see that he looks at the magic marker uh, uh, at one point, right before the elevator dings. Uh, yes, okay. Um, so as, uh, yeah, this sort of plot moves off, moves forward, uh, was, there, was there a particular movie you looked to for inspiration as John turns the tables on the terrorists, becoming the hunter instead of the hunted? You know, uh, that's a really good question. Um, in the Again, in the book, he does pick people off one by one. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, obviously, you know, that's, uh, you know, that the inspiration is there and it's the only way the movie can work. You know, he's clearly outnumbered and it's, it's kind of a common trope in these kind of movies. Uh, even in Rambo, you see, he's like knocking people, you know, he's all covered with mud. He kills this guy, kills that guy. Yeah. So, um, I don't think that's actually a kind of a, a, a breakthrough idea. And that's clearly, it's not his plan. I mean, Rambo and these other similar characters, James Bond and stuff like that, they are, of course, deliberately going after one guard, after another guard, after another guard. But again, he's not trying to do that for most of the picture. He's just trying to stay below the radar, you know? So uh, he's, he ends up, you know, picking them off one by one, but that's only because they're trying to pick him off. I mean, if, if it worked out perfectly for him, he would have called the police and the police would have come mm. and it would have been over. Um, it, you know, a lot of people will sort of analyze this movie. And I've seen, you know, articles and uh, term papers and essays and things. Um, people say act one ends here, there. Um, I don't sort of consciously uh, in, in a very fuzzy sense, I have a sense of a three act construction, but I don't know in, in the beginning that necessarily that act one ends here, what my curtains are going to be. But I find that either because I've been doing this for like 35 years or um, 
uh, in my own sense of like being a consumer of plays and movies, um, I find that I end up falling into a natural three act structure yeah. that may be slightly different than my intention. But without a doubt, the first act of this movie ends when he says, welcome to the party, pal. Yeah. Right. Because he's been trying. He, what's his goal in the first act? First, he wants to get back with his family. Yeah. Right. And that's his main goal. And the secondary goal is I have to stop these criminals if I'm going to get back with my family. Uh, so welcome to the party, pal, is the end of the first act. And if you stop the movie there and uh, interviewed Bruce Willis, if, it, if the movie were made today and everybody had cell phones in the building. <laughs> So what do you hope will happen now? He says, well, I hope the the police will take over. So what happens in the second act is that the the help he gets is worse than the the original problem. So so, uh, this creates the diehard formula, which in my mind only lasted for two movies, which is you are trapped in an environment where neither the authorities or the villains want you there. Mm -hmm. And they both want you out. So that was existed in the first two movies and also in some of the other Die Hard Mank movies. Yeah. You want to be Die Hard also captured <laughs> that. But the Die Hard sequels completely lost that later. So uh, the second act is now instead of hiding, he is uh, being hunted. Well, he's being hunted in the first act and he's hiding in the second act. When he realizes the police are incompetent, he has to reluctantly turn the tables and go on the hunt against the terrorists. But he ends up losing that fight. And the end of the second act is when Han says, gets the the detonators back and says, we are back in business. That's the end of the second act with the villains uh, ascending again. So this is not necessarily what other people have said or the, it's a three act structure, but it is what it is. Yeah, that's interesting. And of course, The police are incompetent, as you say, and they send out one solitary patrol. And this is how we meet Powell. Uh, So, yeah, can you tell me a little bit about this character and sort of how you envisioned him uh, sort of fitting into the story? Well, he was another grounded character, which identified, in other words, he is absolutely a mirror character of uh, of, uh, John McClane. He's another regular blue collar street cop. He also has a family. He also has children. There's a lot of parallels which allow you to accept the immediate bond that they form, which is very important. He's his lifeline. And um, and uh, that character that that was what a Jeb's like bringing ideas, which again was to combine a smaller character of Al Pal. Right. Who is who is there briefly before he's before it's handed over to the authorities. He so what is in the in the book? He, he sort of bonds with with uh, McLean. They have a rapport, but it's in, but it's but it's taken out of Powell's hands and the, uh, the 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 higher authorities take over. So it's like uh, it's an opportunity that escapes him. It eludes him. But by merging the book character of the gypsy taxi driver, who is his conduit to the outside world and communicates the situation is communicated to the outside world and the authorities by the gypsy cab driver. He's the one that calls the police and alerts the police. He's the one that says, don't worry, I got your back. You know, I'll get you some help, but then disappears from the movie. So these two characters, the sympathetic gypsy taxi driver who inherited some of the conversation from the taxi driver in New York on the way to the airport from the book. (laughs) Yeah. You know, combined with Al Pal became a greatly expanded, important character. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it's it's very important. And of course, talking about cribbing from from movies, I don't know if you've seen the Big Red One, the Sam Fuller movie. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there's a wonderful scene in that movie where there's a fight between the Americans and the uh, the Nazi soldiers in an insane asylum. So the the fight is going on in the in the in the uh, commissary of the insane asylum, and the inmates are either cowering from the noise or they're oblivious. And finally, there's this one inmate of the asylum who keeps looking back and forth, right? And then he has this epiphany, and a Nazi soldier drops beside him, and he picks up the weapon, and he starts shooting the Germans and says, I'm sane again! I'm sane again! You remember this moment? Yeah, yeah. And that is totally what we did here with Al Pal, where he relates the story about how he's like, you know, he... 
well, yeah, it's taken off of, you know, he, he shot a kid once, yeah, you know, and he hasn't gotten over it. And that's why he's, and so when he finally shoots, uh, it saves John McClane at the end, there's this look on his face. It's exactly the same thing. Like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> like he said, he goes, Hey, Oh, wait a minute. So it's again, like, so we have to thank uh, Samuel Fuller and Alfred Hitchcock for two of them, a great moments in this movie. We do, as you mentioned, the FBI turn up and like they're idiots. They end up, in fact, shooting at John. But before we get to that moment, we get to that scene where um, Ellis, Holly's slimy co-worker, uh, tries to schmooze with the terrorist. And he's like uh, so cocky about it. He says, I negotiate million dollar deals for breakfast. I can handle these clowns. I wanted to ask whether you've seen the uh, sort of some of the memes that have been doing oh, the yeah, rounds yeah. about yeah, everybody <laughs> sent me them. Yeah, I saw Donald them Trump Jr. It is yeah, pretty I know, I know. Believe me, I see them, and and sometimes I sometimes sometimes I retweet them. Uh, yeah, I've definitely seen those. Um, uh, he uh, he um, uh, Hart Bachner. Uh, he 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 came in to shoot with the beard on. Mm. And uh, for uh, five minutes, two people were upset, but Joel Silver liked the beard. He also ad libbed Hans Boogie. That was an ad lib from his of his. Uh, really? So uh, he uh, did a great job playing the smarmy character. <laughs> yeah. So we then we're sort of absolutely hurtling into the final act now. Um, so we do have that meet cute, as you put it, between uh, John and Hans. We then get to Hans gradually working out that Holly is John's wife, which is something you've withheld all the way through. And it's interesting in terms of the momentum of the film. John is kind of like, you know, picking off like uh, sort of these bad guys one by one. And sort of it really feels like he's unstoppable. And then sort of all of a sudden, Hans puts the pieces together and he's got this final piece of leverage over John. That must have been like a fun thing to write. Uh, well, you know, again, this, this is something that came out of this uh, about the production being in a mad rush to make our release date about me being constantly on the set. And more importantly, about our, our start of the movie was not on schedule because we, the casting and everything goes. So when we started the movie, the first two weeks of filming, he was still doing his show, Moonlighting. So he's filming a, a, a television show in the daytime with like, you know, working hours, like 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and we were filming because the schedule was built around what you can do. We happened to be the schedule was forced into doing actual practical night shooting in the real building. Now, we did build sets, mm -hmm. the big lobby with the waterfall. That was a set. But a tremendous portion of the movie is actually in the real building. The lion's share mm -hmm. is in the real building. So we were filming in the um, uh, real building. And John McTiernan came to me, I guess it was probably four days into the shoot. And he said, look, Bruce is exhausted. And we got the same thing going next week before he's clear from the uh, television show. Can you come up with more stuff for all the other characters so he gets some time off? <laughs> and so that conversation made me build up Thornburg oh, at wow. the TV station, yeah. give him more stuff to do, more business to do. And also gave Holly more to do. So the scene where Holly comes in and confronts Hans, that was invented to give Bruce an opportunity to take a nap in his <laughs> caravan. Yeah. Notice I said caravan for your audience. Say, instead, <laughs> instead, of, instead of trailer. Uh, and there's other examples of that. There, in fact, there was, there was much more material with, with the uh, housekeeper and the children. Mm. You know, you see her briefly. She, she, she says, yes, Mrs. Holly, I already made it the second room. And later on, Thornburg threatens her. I'm going to call immig the, the immigration when she won't let them in. But there are also scenes at the house where, where, the, ki where the kids are watching cartoons mm. and they interrupt the program. And she quickly sees what it is and she changes the channel before the show. You know, so so there was I, I did a much more of this material involving. But as John McTiernan said, and he says it so nicely um, in this hard in this book, you're going to get the coffee table book. He, he did the preface and he gave me a shout out. He said, um, uh, Stephen D'Souza gave me a Fellini movie because uh, he went around the whole town at night. Uh, but uh, again, he but he asked it said we're doing a Midsummer Night's Dream. So uh, but, but when he said, uh, you know, find more material for the supporting cast, uh, it made the movie richer, it made the movie better, and, 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 and it made Bruce survive the first two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Thank God he needed that nap. The ending, Stephen, is iconic. So 
we've already had that explosive moment that, you know, for most films would be the climax. You know, John doing that daring jump off the building and coming back through, which I know was something from the book. But then we have like the real climax. So Hans has Holly captured. He smiles, pulls Holly closer. He jams his weapon against her so hard she cries out. Still the cowboy, Mr. McLean. Americans, all alike. This time, John Wayne does not walk off into the sunset with Grace Kelly. <laughs> McLean replies, that was Gary Cooper, shithead. Han says, what was it you said to me before? yippee ki motherfucker. Now you are fucked. It's then revealed John's got a gun taped behind his back. He and Holly combine to surprise Hans, whose shot falls backwards out the window, and he grabs Holly's watch, the one we saw in that early scene. And there's this really, really tense moment where John's able just to kind of, as just as Hans pulls his gun up to, yeah, shoot them point blank, John's able to remove the watch and Hans, of course, falls to his death. Can you tell me a little bit about like that moment? Did you know early on that that was going to be a final scene and that or did you have that that to aim for? We were always going for that. Again, remember, we thought that was going to be that was originally he actually spoke a little more and revealed they were going to escape in the chaos. Mm. But we cut that out because it was so weak and had the inspiration for the ambulance scene, which I think has already happened in continuity. I think that's already happened. Yeah, I think prior to the scene here. Um, what's fun about that is Rickman. They, they told Rickman, we're going to drop you on three. <laughs> right. And they dropped him on two. <laughs> so his look of surprise. That's real. Totally authentic. <laughs> and of course, uh, you know, when we, when we did this test screening of the movie, when we looked at the, not the test screening in front of an audience, which was spectacular with great scores. But when we looked at the first time and realized we had a problem with the empty truck, that scene, he was still on blue screen mm -hmm. and literally one frame, one 24th of a second later, he hit the airbag. So that shot goes on as long as it possibly can. Wow. It's also over crank. So his, he, he drops in slow motion mm. and you can really see his surprise too, because he's being dropped in slow motion. <laughs> yeah. And actually we mentioned yippee ki -yay, motherfucker there. Did you know, obviously that was something that came from your uh, discussions with Bruce. Did you know, as you kind of put it into the script that, hold on, that's pretty cool. <laughs> There's a possibility that people will latch onto that phrase that it may become like an enduring catchphrase for this film. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, we, you know, sometimes people will guess as to what they think will catch on and we're always wrong. Like for example, um, I think from commando, I think the, uh, there's a lot of lines people quote from commando. But one of them is remember Sully, I said, I would kill you last. I lied. Like that's a line, Pedo. You know, <laughs> we all thought the line that was going to catch on was when he says, come on, Bennett, you don't want to shoot me. You want to look in my eyes when you twist the ice. Come on, Bennett, let's party. We were so convinced that that was the line people would come out like a Broadway show, like, you know, a West End show for your audience. Uh, you want the audience singing the last tune of the musical that if you look at the original poster, go online for Commando, it says, let's party. <laughs> We, he's, we thought, and he's holding, he's holding a knife mm -hmm. and, he, and, he, and he's like in his comments, says, Let, we were sure that would catch on. Um, Stallone was convinced that I'm the disease and you're the cure was going to be the thing for Cobra. You've never heard anybody say that. You've never seen a meme uh, of that um, on Judge Dredd, uh, which um, um, I, I want to assure you right now that Everything that you readers of 2000 AD hate about that was not from me. It was from your own native born UK director. He is <laughs> the one that made him take off the helmet and all those other things that you, I would, you do not like that were in the comic book. But anyway, in that picture, Stallone was convinced that I knew you were going to say that that was going to catch on <laughs> and it did not, you know, so we, we always, we we're always wrong. Uh, but you're right. That has gone on, on to the lexicon. And strangely enough, the writers guild of America, has t-shirts and mugs they sell, which probably are only sold to the Writers Guild members and maybe their family, of famous lines <laughs> from movie like the stuff dreams are made of. Yeah. Somehow they've never done the the coffee mug of yippee ki -yay, motherfucker. I can't un I can't fathom why. I don't know. <laughs> Is there anything that you'd do differently if you're writing this film today? Uh, the only thing that I would do differently, and it's a I, I, it's a fight that I lost. We were in post production. Uh, as I said, you cannot, there's a, there's a, there's a down angle when, the, when, when, you remember when they all, when, um, uh, after Bruce rescues the hostage on the roof yeah. and the, uh, the one American, uh, there's two Americans, Theo 
who is uh, Theo is like the I think he's the only survivor. There's only two survivors of the villains. There's the uh, uh, Italian guy that Bruce knocks out with a gun butt. Yeah. Right in the vault. So he presumably is arrested. They find him unconscious. And the guy, Theo, uh, the guy um, that uh, Argyle knocks out, Theo, uh, who's in in the fake ambulance with the misspelling. Um, But uh, the, uh, the, the, the American with kind of a Texas accent who was in the lobby. Yeah. He says, something's wrong. They're coming back down. And that's why he says, blow the roof, right? So the shot where they, where, where they all start running down is an extended shot. And the guy, the, um, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Alexander Gudinov mm. is hanging there dead. And he's hanging there so long in that shot. It's impossible to believe that he comes back to life. Yeah. And I kept in post-production, I'm saying, you can't keep that. You, you can't use that. You, you, you can't use that shot. And the, and the editor said, it's a great shot. It's a great shot. But I, it, it, it always drives me crazy when I see the movie again, that it kind of makes it much harder to believe that. In other words, if you see, the last time you saw him, Bruce put the chain around his neck. The guy goes like this and Bruce leaves the shot. So in your mind, maybe he He's got gone. loose a second later. Yeah. When he shows up later, you don't question how he got, he figured, oh, he wasn't dead. But when he's hanging there for like 20 seconds in this extended shot, you know, uh, it, it, it drives me crazy to this day. Uh, <laughs> a funny story about the actor who plays, there's only two Americans in the crew. They're all, far, they're all uh, evil foreigners. Uh, <laughs> the guy in the lobby, who was the guy, the guy they put in the lobby who tells, who's watching a football game and he says, oh, yeah, yeah. And he said when, the, when, when Al Powell comes in, he says, sure, look around. But like, you know, you know, he's getting ready to kill him, you know, um, around the time he had been cast in the movie. He had worked. He had, he had been a bad guy for uh, Joel Silver and Larry Gordon in um, Action Jackson. So they knew him. So they said, sure, you're in the movie. So around this time, he was um, lo- he was auditioning um, uh, pub- uh, publicity agents. And my sister in law was a publicist. Uh, so he goes in to meet her. And he, she says, her name is Bobby Marcus, this, Bobby, Bobby Marcus D'Souza. He sees her name or whatever. He says, D'Souza, are you related to Stephen D'Souza? Cause I'm doing a movie now that he wrote. She said, yes, that's my brother-in-law. <laughs> she, he says, he says, I play one of like a dozen terrorists and I get killed on page 20. If you can get him to kill me later, I'll sign with you. <laughs> so she called me up. And said, you know, can you kill this guy later? So I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> this now this now proves the like in, in, the uh, incredible incestuous uh, incestuous uh, nepotism in Hollywood that I killed this guy later. <laughs> yeah, so, so he, he got the, so now so I don't not, not only did I kill him later, he got killed last, <laughs> next to last. He's the last guy who gets killed before before uh, Hans Gruber. Wow, fair enough. Um, so we've talked a little bit about sequels you did the second film which was a critical success and a commercial success but as we've talked about like the further the franchise has gone on the further it's kind of got away from that groundedness that like made die hard so great and the vulnerability that makes that gives you a real sense of like peril and like wow i don't know mclean isn't this superhero he could actually die at any point do you think at this point the franchise should just be left alone? There's like all this talk about like a prequel TV show and, and some further movies. What would you like to see happen? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's time to move on. In fact, the idea that, again, when they were talking about the the, the, the now abandoned plan uh, of, of Die Hard Year One, which was actually a comic book. Yeah, it actually was a comic book. I think six issues. Um, and I remember people talking about it, hyping it uh, from the studio or the or the uh, one of the producers. Or uh, uh, By the way, uh, the original producers, Larry Gordon, uh, his production company, he sold the rights to uh, Synergy and is no longer involved in the movies. I think that's one of the reasons why it sort of lost its way, frankly. Yeah. Uh, yeah he had, to, he, you know, he, he, we all knew what we were consciously doing. He's, you know, he's, uh, he's not a hero. He's like vulnerable. All those things got lost. Uh, but the idea, like, we're going to see, we want to do a prequel to show how he became the diehard John McClane we all know. I says, no, that is diehard. That is a story how an ordinary cop, rose to the occasion and become became uh, a, a tremendous hero. Mm-hmm. You know, a prequel of that is like completely pointless and superfluous. I think it's worth looking into the um, 
uh, evolution of these things. Now, the first uh, movie, which is very rich and has great characterizations, began as a novel. And when you make a movie out of a novel, it's an adaptation. You have to peel stuff away. Um, if you shot almost any novel word for word, it'd be eight hours long, you know. So you still have that core of a deep characterization that would, would be in a novel. The second movie is also based on a novel, but it had nothing to do with Die Hard. It's a third party novel, but nonetheless, it was a novel. And although it changed radically, um, for example, um, I, my thinking was when they said, what are you going to do for the sequel? And it was the same thing. We had scripts lying around. And I said, this would work, but it's exactly what we don't want to do. It's terrorists. It's even worse. It's Arab terrorists, which is the, the Chuck Norris, you know, kind of go to thing, which yeah. has already become a cliche. And I think that if the first movie was the external enemy, the second movie should be an internal enemy. It should be, we've met the enemy, you know, that should be different. And let's, uh, but what the book had was it had a unity of time, place, and action. It was an airport, right? And that character was like a cop who was in charge of airport security. That doesn't work. He's got to be an outsider. So trying to maintain the integrity of the second novel, but incorporating the diehard characters gave us a rich story. He's still scared. He's still over his head. And one of the main things he wanted to recapture was his vulnerability. And that's why <coughs> he tries to stop a plane from catching and fails. Mm. That is not in the source material. It wasn't in the previous draft of the script that was put in there to get him back to that vulnerable guy we feel. Because you see desperately waves. He makes torches. He's waving at the plane. It crashes. Then he walks through the wreckage. There's like a burning teddy bear, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and he's like a broken man. You see him in the next scene, uh, you know, so uh, so these first two things capture the unity of time, place and action. And again, they both were based on novels. The third movie was based on a script called Simon Says, which is kind of a buddy cop movie that was actually going to be for five minutes, a lethal weapon sequel. Wow. You can see how it easily would have adapted. Yeah. Uh, there but because it was an existing script and they decided we don't have a script all our ideas fell apart i actually was brought in to uh to do to do that movie but i was c committed to something at paramount and i couldn't i couldn't get free i had a legal legal commitment to paramount but i actually had i actually had um a meetings on it and the um the one thing we're talking about like you know, my childhood influences again the one note i remember which was not followed was that they were instead of this cockamamie thing with garbage trucks and going to Canada was that we saw the bad guys doing welding and stuff all the whole time, just like they're do, drilling into the safe and diehard one. I had the villains doing some kind of welding and like you know, back it up. We, we didn't know what they were doing or some kind of like workmanship. Yeah. And it turned out that like Goldfinger in Goldfinger, who was hiding his smuggled gold in the bodywork of his Rolls Royce. Mm. Remember, originally, they didn't, want, they didn't know Goldfinger was going to steal Fort Knox. They're trying to figure out how he's smuggling gold. That was the, that was the plot. Uh, so I had that one of the school, but that the reason they did the whole school thing was they had their own school bus, which had all the gold in the body of the school bus. So it was completely organic. Mm. And they had their own school bus driver. Can remember all the bus, right? They, so in other words, they had their own school bus yeah. with their own driver that pretended to be one of the buses that had just dropped evacuated kids. So I know that was a note. That was one note I remember giving, which I wish they had done. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was based on an existing screenplay where immediately they lost the idea of of uh, McLean trapped in a place uh, pinned between the villains and the heroes. Here, he's not trapped. He drives all over Manhattan and ends up going to Canada at the end of the picture. And the police are helping him. <laughs> so we're getting two things wrong. Mm -hmm. The next one was again a spec script that was called World War III that was abandoned after 9-11 because it did have like buildings being blown up and things like that from terrorists and then became this strange, you know, cyber crime where they, 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 you think they blew up the White House, but it was, they did, they did CGI. Right. A lot of desperate reaches in my opinion. <laughs> and in that one, again, he's, 
no longer confined. Instead of just driving all over Manhattan, he's all over the East Coast. And again, he has all this help. And then there, there was the one with the sun and he's in Russia and he's like a superhero and he's throwing cars and helicopters and he's no longer, never shows fear anymore at all. You know, he's become a superhero. Um, well, you know, I, what I liked about the, the whatever grounding in reality in the second, in the um, second film, he sort of had some celebrity. Yeah. Because plausibly in the wake of the first movie, news crews would have tracked him down the next day and interviewed him. Yeah. Yeah. He would have been, you know, what would have happened between movies? That's why there's references to him having been on television. And he says, don't I know? Yeah, I get that a lot. You know, that's why we, you know, it was just a, just a hint of reality. And again, shows he is uncomfortable with being perceived as some kind of superhero. Mm. He doesn't like the attention. So this, you know, and even his being a, um, a, a technophobe, you see, he doesn't know how to operate the fax machine. Yeah. At one point. And uh, all the, all these characteristics of being like vulnerable, being afraid of even in the second movie, he says, I'm afraid to fly. Yeah. Right? And this is why are you in this helicopter? He says, I'm more afraid of losing. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so the, the things that made him a vulnerable, relatable um, um, antidote and, and palate cleanser to all the macho heroes we had before, uh, they fell out. And by the time of the last picture, I don't know what the difference is between him and Chuck Norris, except it's a more expensive movie. Do you live in fear of them at some point trying to remake it? Or, uh, I mean, yeah, what, what would your feeling be? If oh, I don't know. I, I, for five minutes, they were going to remake Commando. And yeah. I'm going like, that's just kind of ridiculous because the remake of Commando is the movie we script we abandoned. I mean, w what makes Commando work is these bigger than life stunts he does. Like in a normal movie, like the, in the normal movie, the, some of the bad guys make, trying to make a phone call, the hero yanks the wire out of the wall. And Commando, he picks up the phone booth with the guy and that pulls the wire out of the wall. Yeah. You, you, you know what I'm saying? In a normal movie, if you have a normal actor and you're trying to get somebody to talk, you throw them up against the wall by their collar. Yeah. You don't hold them over a cliff. <laughs> so the idea that Commando was going to be made a more grounded, real version of Commando. That's like, say, we're going to make Star Wars, but on Earth. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, like, so I, I was glad to hear that that idea was abandoned. Mm. Uh, what, what I've noticed is there's this tendency with remakes that if you remake it, it's got to be dark. Yeah. Uh -huh. now, and I have some kind of schadenfreude that uh, several things that I worked on were remade and sort of tanked because they said, so for example, uh, I did uh, one of my first job as story editor on the bionic shows did the bionic woman. Now the bionic woman was supposed to be the sunny day lit antidote to the more grim spy related $6 million man. Mm. It's not remotely, you know, that dark, but nonetheless, it was sunny, bright. Her day job was a school teacher, you know, so they did the re reboot of the bionic woman and made it dark and gritty. Abandoning what made it work. And again, that got canceled in like seven weeks. Knight Rider, when we went and pitched Knight Rider, the network, we said, this is the Western reduced to its like essentials. Yeah. The cowboy and his horse and the horse talks. <laughs> yeah that's it that's the whole cast right so in in knight rider he had the car and he had you know and the hero he had a boss and he had the girl i added um who was the mechanic so we'd have kind of a sparring relationship at work i named her after my ex-wife so she whatever it reruns she gets a check so uh <laughs> good for her anyway so uh uh when they did the reboot they gave him a supporting, they have a, have a NASA room. There was a room like NASA with 50 tech uh, technicians and the whole infrastructure, the, the Knight Rider, uh, the Knight Rider uh, 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 project. Uh, and one of the things when I was on the show, um, uh, I said, they kept saying, can he have, could he have a missile launcher? Uh, uh, could he have machine guns like James Bond? I said, much as I love James Bond, if he has weapons on the car, he'll never get out of the car. Yeah. The car does not have any offensive weapons. And I put it in the Bible. It's when they did the reboot, the car had machine guns and laser beams and all kinds of crazy <laughs> stuff. And again, canceled in six weeks because what made it work got completely lost in yeah. the shuffle. Yeah. And just think about how many remakes have tanked where they, they, they brought them back and they got like dark and gritty and disturbed and troubled. Now, I'm not saying the dark and gritty and disturbed and troubled doesn't work. You know, the mento doesn't work with a happy hero, <laughs> you know, 
Uh, but um, uh, will I see one of my movies remade yet? I suppose it could happen. And I wish it well, because I'll get a check. But at, least, <laughs> but at least do it right, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, Stephen, it sounds like you've got so much fun stuff coming up. I mean, we were talking before uh, going on air about like some of the projects you've been working on. Can you can you reveal anything about like your slate of upcoming stuff? Because it sounds really fun. Uh, yeah, uh, right now, what's really funny is um, that this last six months, which like Hollywood is ground to a halt, uh, kind of dumb luck. Um, I have three things I'm working on, all with people uh, in the e- in the EU. So I have a TV series uh, that I'm doing for Studio Babelsberg, uh, which is kind of like um, um, uh, a a neo-noir series. Um, There was a TV series called Ray Donovan here in America. You may have seen it where a guy is kind of a troubleshooter for hire. So it's sort of like that. Only uh, it's a guy in the art world. Uh, He's a a German-American character who was um, now returned uh, returned to Germany. Um, uh, in the wake of a tragedy, uh, and gets drawn into um, uh, uh, tra- drawn into smuggling some artwork, and, and then becomes this kind of troubleshooter character. So I've had all these conference calls with the guys in Berlin, uh, and then I have a project with a uh, Swedish producers, which is kind of it started in a strange way. They said we want to do just like uh, Die Hard became a Christmas movie. We want to go in and make a consciously Christmas movie. That's an action movie, but it's really Christmassy, like with Santa Claus, <laughs> right? It's like, okay, so it was such a challenge. I embraced it. Yeah. Uh, and then I have a project with Simon West, uh, who directed um, Con Air or stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, which we hope to be filming in December, which is kind of an action adventure rom-com. If I had, I made the joke earlier about a rom-com, but it's kind of an action adventure rom-com <laughs> if I had to establish it. Like uh, Romancing the Stone or uh, I would say an example or Mr. and Mrs. Smith, uh, mm-hmm. something like that. So like, you know, like, um, uh, th- th- it's just odd that the past four or five months I've been writing and like working and going to zoom meetings. Like, uh, I've been more busy than I was all of last year. So it's, it, it's kind of crazy. So, uh, that's what's in the pipeline. Well, Stephen, we have talked for hours. <laughs> You've been so generous with your time. You, uh, right, you came- the, do you have a time frame? You have to boil this down to like 30 minutes now or what? Oh yeah. Or like 15 minutes. <laughs> no, no, we'll run it. <laughs> you came on the show, we got together, had a few laughs. <laughs> Stephen, <laughs> it's been so fun and you've been so generous with your time. Do you have a final message to all the people who, as ever, as every Christmas, over the you know next coming days, they're going to be re-watching Die Hard? Well, I, I want to absolutely say that it absolutely meets the requirements of a, um, of a uh, Christmas movie. Uh, in fact, uh, do you want me to like uh, open my chart up here and say... Uh, <laughs> now and or do you want to wait till i send it to you for your website uh, it's, it's completely up to you yeah all right let me see uh if i can find it in my drop up christmas uh christmas movie or not checklist here it is i'm excited for this okay um christmas movie or not checklist so we have to find a baseline what is the definition of a christmas movie and i think we could all agree even the skeptics on whether die hard is a christmas movie or not uh would agree that white christmas a 1950s movie with uh Bing Crosby and Danny Kaye, a mm. musical, is a Christmas movie. Yeah. So let's examine the, uh, the, the check, check the boxes. Does the movie take place during the Christmas holiday? Die yeah. Hard takes place entirely during Christmas. <laughs> yep. White Christmas, only the first scene and the final scene occur on Christmas, and they take place eight years apart <laughs> or 10 years apart. The, all right. The opening scene is the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge, where the, the counterattack from the, uh, from the Nazi army was on Christmas Day when the weather was bad and the Allies would be overconfident because they advanced so far into Europe and the, uh, the sky was overcast so there was no air cover. And the final scene of White Christmas is t- 10 years later when they have a reunion of the soldiers at a, uh, at a resort, a ski resort. Mm. Is the setting a Christmas party? Die Hard is entirely set at a Christmas party. <laughs> White Christmas, only the final scene is a Christmas party. How many Christmas songs are in the movie? Die Hard has four. Let It Snow, Winter Wonderland, Christmas in Hollis, and Jingle Bells. White Christmas has only two Christmas songs. 
White Christmas, of course, <laughs> and a movie called Snow, which is arguably not even a Christmas song. It's just a weather song. Mm. The party venue is threatened in both movies. In Die Hard, it is threatened by terrorists. In White Christmas, the party venue, the ski resort, is threatened because the bank is foreclosing on it. Not quite the same thing. <laughs> both movies have a broadcaster with a hidden agenda. In Die Hard, of course, it's the infamous Dick Thornburg. In White Christmas, it's Johnny Grant, who is the host of a TV show who is going to broadcast the Christmas party at the end of the movie. The German ringleader in Die Hard is Hans Gruber. The German ringleader in White Christmas is Hitler in the opening scene. Yeah. The government incompetence that makes both movies work is the FBI overreacts in Die Hard. In White Christmas, the Pentagon fires General Waverly, leading him to buy the troubled ski resort only to find it's underwater. <laughs> so Bing Crosby comes back to rescue it. The body count. In Die Hard, 23 people are killed. Some people say to me, Die Hard cannot be a Christmas movie because you kill people. And I say, was Ellis killed? Yes. I said, we don't see Ellis killed. He's killed off camera. Does that still count? Do off camera deaths count? Well, yes. Okay. Well, if we're counting Willis, if we're counting Ellis who's killed off camera, 23 people are killed in Die Hard. But now that you, my skeptic about Die Hard being a Christmas movie, Admit that off-camera deaths count, the body count in White Christmas is 26,128 people in the Battle of the Bulge, which is the opening scene of the movie. Finally, what is the gift of the Magi like? Selfless sacrifice. Keeping with Christmas, hmm. it's Bruce Willis running barefoot over broken glass. In White Christmas, Danny Kay gives his first class ticket to the girl he wants to make it with. He <laughs> upgrades her. Yeah. So you be the judge, which is more Christmassy, and I will provide a, a, I will find this actual checklist I've read to you for you to put on your website. <laughs> there it is. It's official. Stephen, this has been so, so, so much fun. Thank you so much. All right. And uh, all I can say is uh, yippee-ki-yay. <laughs> You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Kamal Demack, with music from Stefan Bindley-Taylor. Get in touch. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, or you can email us, thescriptapartpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.